would like to start with an apology because my voice is not uh, so good. So uh, I hope it will be okay until the end of uh, my talk. Um, I must say that I was delighted to receive the invitation to speak in this important conference and I commend all the joining forces that created this conference. It is extremely important that uh, we in Israel enhance the level of knowledge we have on our region and maybe, just maybe, um, we will become players in this region and not just affected by it. Uh, on this last sentence I uh, wrote a book, but this is for a different topic. I was asked by Professor uh, Ephraim uh, Karsh to comment on the political maneuvers uh, of Qatar and their implications. And I will surprise you or not by stating right in the beginning of my talk that Qatar's foreign relations are all about maintaining Qatar's independence from Saudi Arabia. A quick history reminder, in 1995 the former Emir Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani took over power from his father and since that moment he was terrified by the Saudi reaction. Traditionally and historically Qatar was always obedient to Saudi dominance in foreign relations, security and other issues concerning the Arabian Gulf region. The grandfather of the current Emir, Sheikh Khalifa Al Thani, never questioned Saudi policy. He was very much liked by uh, uh, Arabian Gulf uh, countries, but also by Egypt and others, basically because of his lack of ambition to neither play a role nor to appear on any kind of stage, be it Arabian stage, let alone international one. In the time of the takeover of 1995, the Saudis were very unhappy. And this is why the new Emir acted very fast to build strategic alliance with the United States. The first move made by Qatar was literally begging the Americans to move US military forces from Saudi Arabia to Qatar. The Qataris built Al Udaid Air Force and uh, it is very uh, unusual uh, to let you know that in 1995 the Qataris spent two billion US dollars to build this air base and this is the only American air base outside of the United States that was actually built by foreign money. I arrived with my family in August uh, 1999 and I do recall hearing rumors on a weekly basis that thousands of US soldiers are moving to Qatar but it took a couple of years and in accordance with the stagnation of the US-Saudi relations that the US moved major forces to Al Udaid until finally the US Central Command was moved to Qatar. The reason for those movements, for those rumors, were basically to send a clear message that Qatar has a strong position in America foreign policy. And it was some kind of uh, a protection that Qatar was looking at from the Saudis. The second action that was taken by Qatar in 1995 was to establish economic relations with the State of Israel and to allow the opening of the economic mission in Doha in 1996. It was common knowledge that Qatar wanted to build favorable relations with the Jewish community in the United States and establishing relations with Israel was a major step in that direction. But it took Qatar two years to build strong presence in Washington through signing major contracts, economic contracts, with American firms in the oil and gas sectors and other economic conglomerates in the US through also building a bilateral economic council based in Washington headed by the former US ambassador to Qatar. And as much as the relations with the US became stronger, as much as the relations with Israel became less appealing and less important to the Qataris. Qatar didn't need Israel, and the Qataris made every effort possible to decrease the intensity and substance of those relations. In 2009, Qatar decided to cut relations with Israel during the Gaza War, also known as Operation Cast Lead. The Qatar policy from 1995 was called Policy of Balances, and I'll explain what does it mean. 
Qatar was part of the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. In the same time, Qatar made a major effort to maintain good relations with Iran, unlike the other Gulf states. In 1999, for example, Qatar was the only Arabian country to allow the Taliban from Afghanistan to open a cultural representation office in Doha. I remember in 2000, in the year 2000, that Fidel Castro of Cuba was invited to an official visit for three days in Doha. Believe me when I tell you, there is nothing to do in Doha for three days. Especially not official stuff. And of course, the establishment of Al Jazeera TV network in Doha and hiring Arabian journalists from all the radical movements you can even imagine. Marxist journalists from Jordan, radical members of the Muslim Brothers from Egypt, as well as many others, aiming to have an open platform for all radical school of thoughts to push away any kind of criticism on Qatar, on Qatar's relations with the US, on Qatar's relations with Israel, on Qatar extravagant investments in luxury companies in Europe. But it, in the end of the day, Al Jazeera was a powerful tool, or weapon if you may, as it was clear during the Arabian Spring, and its influence on build-up of public demonstrations in the Arab world. Al Jazeera was one of the most anti-US media network, and in the same time, the Qataris enjoyed US tolerance due to the American values supporting free speech and uncensored media. Qatar's position in the US was getting stronger, but it was dramatically enhanced during the years 2009 to 2017, eight years of the Obama presidency. Somehow, Qatar, the Muslim Brothers of Egypt, Turkey, and, some, and to the some extent Iran, were seen by Obama as an alliance of countries and movements representing the true will, the free will of the people of the Middle East. In contrast to the oppressing regimes, in his opinion, starting with Ben Ali in Tunisia, Mubarak of Egypt, and Assad of Syria. The Qataris fully understood the US decision-making process during those eight years. And in particular, they took advantage of the shaky relations between Bibi Netanyahu and Obama, as well as the tension that was existing between Obama and parts of the Jewish leadership in the US. Qatar was very active during the Arabian Spring, mainly through Al Jazeera and its influence on public opinion in the troubled Arabian countries. I recall visiting Zimbabwe in Africa in April 2012, opening the TV in my room, finding three or four Al Jazeera channels in Arabic. One of them was a channel in Arabic fully dedicated to Egypt. 24-hour broadcast reporting on demonstrations in the various cities, even informing the public that the demonstration will take place in this city, in that neighborhood, to be honest, I was surprised. It was just before Mohammed Morsi of the Muslim Brothers was elected to the president of Egypt. Qatar made a major effort to support the Muslim Brothers through Al Jazeera before Morsi. And after he was elected president, after he was elected president, Qatar provided Egypt billions of dollars as economic aid. Those were the years where Qatar made major role in the change in the Middle East and in some of the governments of those countries. This policy was in accordance with the Obama policy at the time and in total contradiction with the policy of Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE and Bahrain. There was only one exception in Bahrain. If you recall, in Bahrain started uh, major demonstrations. Hundreds of thousands of people were in the streets and it was the only time that the GCC decided to take immediate actions and Qatar was forced to support the rule in Bahrain and Al Jazeera in a kind of magic stopped reporting about demonstrations in Bahrain. 600 soldiers from Saudi Arabia moved to Bahrain, took over the house of the parliament and from that point 
Qatar was reluctant or Al Jazeera was reluctant to report any major changes in Bahrain. But I have to say that Qatar started to feel the heat in Washington in the year 2014. During Operation Tsukaitan in Gaza, where it became clear that ma the massive economic support of Qatar to Hamas was used to build Hamas military infrastructure. At the time, some parts of the U.S. Senate became active in this matter. I recall Senator Dianne Feinstein that was very instrumental to open a discussion on Capitol Hill regarding Qatar's support for terror. The foreign minister of Qatar at the time, who is now the defense minister, came on CNN arguing that Qatar's support is for the people of Gaza and not Hamas. It was not convincing on CNN and it was not convincing on Capitol Hill. As an immediate action, Qatar cut its financial support to Hamas and took a low-key position since. Khaled Mashal of Hamas was asked to leave Qatar in order to make sure that this crisis doesn't jeopardize Qatar's relations with the U.S. But it should be clear that Qatar maintained its relations with ISIS, with Al-Qaeda, with Al-Qaeda fractions, and all other fundamentalist terror groups. The Obama administration at that time was pleased with the role of Qatar in getting hijacked American journalists to be free in Syria, as much as Qatar mediating in all other cases of this kind. On one hand, Qatar provided financial support to terrorists and in the same time mediated the release of those kidnapped by them. But nobody prepared the Qataris to the change in Washington and the victory of Donald Trump. The Saudis, who suffered from Obama as much as Egypt and Israel, were keen to take advantage in this change and, build, and to build relations with the newly elected president. After Trump's visit to Saudi Arabia in May 2017, the Saudis took an aggressive position towards Qatar and together with the UAE and Bahrain imposed the blockade on Qatar in last June 2017. Since the end of June 2017, the Qataris have been acting in the same way they acted after the takeover of 1995. And I must say that their efforts are successful in a lot of aspects. The story of how Qatar overcame the 2017 crisis and became the toast of Washington again is due to major PR campaigns the Emirates launched using lobbying and PR firms in the US. Some of Qatar's efforts are public because firms, PR, not PR, uh, lobbying firms, that works with had to file under the US Department of Justice Foreign Agent Registration Act. So for our information, in June and July 2017, Qatar retained the services of eight firms in the US, and then nine more later, later in the year. According to the filed contracts, Doha agreed to pay between $50,000 to $500,000 a month to each. Qatar was up against similar, uh, similar lobbying by the UAE and Saudi Arabia, both of which also retain dozens of firms and pay millions of their services in Washington. But on June 7, they signed an agreement with the Ashcroft Law Firm to engage John Ashcroft, former Attorney General, to respond to the crisis. Qatar's PR firms also printed added claiming Qatar is America's strongest ally in fighting ISIS and that the US and Qatar have shared values. They recognize the different policy of the US Foreign Secretary Tillerson and acted in this direction. Tillerson's pro-Qatar stance was highlighted in the leaflets. The battle culminated in the September 18 to 28 campaign to lift the blockade, it was called, claiming it was illegal and Qatar will prevail. They built even a website, liftheblockade.com, and bought full pages ads in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Google, Snapchat, mobile billboards, and Fox and CNN, of course. 
the ads specifically targeted the UN headquarters, the financial district in New York, the Times Square and JFK Airport. According to one insider who has observed the Doha campaign, the Qataris found allies in Tillerson and Secretary of Defense Matisse. Both cabinet members were surprised by the Saudi decision to cut relations with Doha in June. Both secretaries were troubled with the timing and felt it could distract the fight against Iran and extremism. The source actually said that US President Donald Trump's speech in Riyadh in May had made the Saudis think they would get support from the president. The Saudis moved without checking with Matisse and Tillerson, both of whom have taken the view that the US needs Qatar, central command is in Doha. Yesterday, I spoke to a friend who is one of the lobbying firms extremely active since the beginning of the Trump presidency. And I have to say a word about it. Usually lobbying firms in Washington are divided. Some of them are active towards Democrats. Some of them are active towards Republicans. There are now a third wing. Lobbying firms that are active towards the White House of Donald Trump. It's neither Republican nor Democrat. He explained to me that after the Qataris understood that the Saudis have jeopardized Qatar position in Washington, they established in Qatar independ three independent task forces. The Emir was heading the first one, the Prime Minister the second, and the third was headed by the Foreign Minister. Each one of those task forces is employing separate lobbying firms, separate PR firms, and there is no connection between those firms. Obviously. Money is not an issue. You could see positive signs and achievement for this policy when Foreign Minister Mohammed bin Abdurrahman Al Thani and the Defense Minister Khaled Al Atiyah were in Washington at the end of January 2018 signing agreements and meeting the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Secretary of Defense Jim Matisse as part of the US Qatar Strategic Dialogue CONFAB. Alatia, following on the old successful policy of 1995, told reporters that the Emirate will expand U.S. CENTCOM's Aludeh Air Base, home to 10,000 troops. Altani addressed the American Enterprise Institute event on changing dynamics in the Gulf and was so happy with the results of his trip that he was all over Twitter tweeting about the strengthening the Qatar-US relations. I am told that lately the Qataris have signed a contract with a special lobbying firm specializing in building support among the Jewish ultra-Orthodox community in the US. They have given up their previous arrogant policy and they are not taking any chances. Lately, it was brought to my attention that the head of the Qatari aid task force in Gaza has asked the lobbying firm in Israel to assist him in fixing meetings with Israeli ministers. This provides us with the understanding that despite the improvement of Qatar's position in the U.S. since June 2017, they want to make sure we don't, we the Israelis, don't play an active role to change that. Ladies and gentlemen, Every day brings better news for Qatar, but being familiar with the current leadership of Qatar, I can say that they are very much concerned. They fear two leaders in the Gulf. The first is Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdul Aziz Saud, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, and the second, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. Both leaders are young, able, capable, unpredicted, and potentially dangerous to Qatar and its current leadership. In my opinion, Qatar will play a very careful policy and try not to be caught in a pro-terror act. Thank you very much.